Hello again, this is Helen Thomas on the CDFM study group. We will continue review of CDFM module four. We're gonna look at competency four, life cycle sustainment. Whenever you start a new section, what do you need to do? You need to go from the beginning and how do you get to life cycle sustainment? You had to identify a capability need. You went through the material solution analysis phase. Initial capabilities document told you what type of capability was needed. Then we looked at what type of human integration we're going to have to have, what type, how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to afford it through the resource management. Now we're going to look at life cycle sustainment. As we said, what if this project is a five year, 10 year project? Life cycle, over that life cycle, there are things that has to be considered in the beginning before you even develop the item. So on the bottom of page 441, it says in that paragraph in the middle, the program manager is responsible for providing the needed product support capability to maintain the rep. So basically who's responsible in acquisition? <laughs> program manager, when in doubt, pick the PM. So I'm not gonna linger on that, linger on that one. On the bottom of page 443, life cycle sustainment planning shall be considered when? During material solution analysis. So from the start, you're looking at the life cycle. Not only are they, you take the initial capabilities document to figure out what type of capability you need, the thought process and the acquisition then has to go to, how are we gonna sustain the item? Once we buy it, build it, buy it, distribute it to the warfighter, how is it going to be sustained? So the life cycle sustainment plan is considered during material solution analysis. However, the actual plan must be done before you get to milestone B. So remember, formal program initiation begins at milestone B. So all the major documents that needs to be prepared, we talked about acquisition program baseline, we talked about the card, cost description, we talked about assessment, affordability assessment, survivability, technology risk, all this stuff need to be prepared. So it's being considered in the beginning, but it needs to be prepared for milestone B. We even talked about, wait, let me make sure I don't, I, we said it earlier. Yeah, the SEP, the evaluation plan is produced before milestone A, technology strategy, and then the acquisition strategy for milestone B. So I'm just recapping, that's what you need to do, tie in the information. You cannot treat it as if it's an information just by itself. Recap and tie it all together. So the life cycle sustainment plan is prepared prior to milestone B. That's what I pull out of that. Cradle to grade. All right, so when we look at life cycle, we're looking at interoperability. Can it fit with other things, other parts, data management? On the bottom of page 446, my note says configuration management. You need to know that definition. Process of establishing and maintaining the consistency of a product's physical and functional attributes with its design and operational information throughout its life cycle. How are we going to keep it, the information up to date for the life cycle of that product? Page 447, life cycle sustainment activities. In that life cycle, you got pre-acquisition. Acquisitions process, that's a milestone B. And then sustainment, operations and support. What I want to point out on page 448 on the post IOC, on the sustainment, and then the post IOC product support strategy, the last sentence. These reviews occur normally every three to five years after IOC, initial operational capability, or when precipitated. So what testing? The DOD components must conduct post-deployment after they deploy an equipment or an automation equipment, a system into the inventory that every three to five years, they have to 
then do a review to check to see if it's still performing properly. The bottom of page 448 reintroduces again initial the ICD. That's the document where the JROC initially started off with. I'm going to highlight there. On page 449, goes into analysis of the alternative. You already talked about that. Technology development strategies done before milestone A, where you come up with your key performance parameters, key supporting attributes, acquisition program baseline, where the program manager gives that starting numbers and uses those different cost estimating methods to do it. Acquisition strategy is milestone B and beyond. So that's just recapping what I know. The SEP is produced. Acquisition strategy, tests and evaluation, systems engineering plan. So I'm just reading again. And then the life cycle sustainment plan. We already mentioned the life cycle sustainment plan is prepared before milestone B. According to DOD instruction 5000.02 requires it be produced as part of the acquisition strategy. Again, technology development strategy equates to milestone A. Acquisition strategy equates to starting at milestone B. So that's how I know it's milestone B because acquisition strategy starts at milestone B. All right, page 4413, second paragraph says, the essence of PBL, what does PBL stand for? Performance-based life cycle support. I wanna make sure that item can still perform based on what I developed it to do. So the essence of performance base is buying performance outcome, not the individual parts and repair actions. So can it do? I don't care how it gets done. I don't care how what kind of parts you need to put together and repair to do it, but I'm buying outcome. That's what you need to know. Performance-based life cycle support the essence of PBL is buying outcome. And so on page 4415, that diagram with the performance-based agreement, your program manager being the middle person there, the PM, he then have to find out what the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the warfighter needs are. And then he gets the contractor, the industry to support fill that capability gap. So that's all that's showing. He has an agreement with the force provider, which is your warfighter, and an agreement with the commercial contractor to get a particular product accomplished. So 4415. Again, I like diagrams because it's easier to remember. So I'm going to also go over to Competency number five, human systems integration. So we have this system and now you have to consider human beings being integrated. If it's an aircraft, what type of pilots, what type of training, what type of skills, what type of safety considerations do we need to have in place because we're putting people in this equipment? So those are all the things that are considered. On the bottom of page 451, again, I'm in pay, on competency number five, human systems integration, because these are small sections. The program manager should use the elements of human systems integration to design and develop the systems, that's what I just said, and effectively and affordably integrate with human capabilities and implica implications, limitations. What? <laughs> human systems integration planning is summarized in the acquisition strategy and the SEP, systems engineering plan. So acquisition category, acquisition strategy is telling you for milestone B and the SEP is produced in milestone A to support the technology strategy and it's produced in milestone B to support the acquisition strategy. Total systems approach. 
On page 452 in that second paragraph, so you have manpower, personnel, training, human factors, engineering. You got all the different categories of human system domains that they have to consider. So you, manpower is looking at how many people we need, number of. Personnel, what type of people, what skills do they need? Training, what type of training do they need? PM responsibility. Survivability, can they walk away alive or if they're attacked? So on the personnel, what I have here is towards the end of that paragraph, this target audience description identifies the cognitive, physical, so a TAD. Target audience description is a document that lists the, the specific types of personnel needed to work with that equipment. The program manager uses the TAD as a baseline for personal requirements assessment. So I have that highlighted. On the top of page 453, that top paragraph, I also have on the training, the types of training. So it says, both the sponsor and the program manager should give careful consideration and priority to the use of embedded training as defined in DOD directive. Okay, so let me see. I have a note somewhere. Hold on, bear with me. I am in competency five. So I'm going through my notes because I made separate notes. So that's why when I take the test, I'm more comfortable because I not only go through the study guide, then I go through and write individual notes. So it says training. Training is a learning process by which personnel individually acquires. It is more effective to use embedded training. So I think this comes up again later. It's triggering something in my brain that I can't let go. My OCD kick it in. But I think what it is is embedded training versus standalone. And I got to read, training is a learning process. That's the definition on the bottom of page two and then the top of page three. Priority, we want to use embedded training, training that's included with the entire equipment. So they're actually using the equipment. The bottom of page four, five, three goes into environmental, right? Safety consideration. Safety factors are system design characteristics. Minimizing, so you are dead. That's like your risk assessment or another lack of a better word. Safety, 453. 454, habitability. Living conditions, can they live in those conditions? Do you have air conditioning? Does it need air conditioner if the place they're going is hot? Do they have heat if it's cold? So habitability is the ability to live and survive in that environment. 452 on page 455, let's see what this talks about. More systems integration. And as required by DOD, the program manager shall employ. So this is repeating again, 452, nothing there. But let's go to page 457, integration of human factors. Now we wanna integrate them into the process. The key to a successful integration. So the program manager should integrate the system requirements for the eight HSI domains listed in chapter 5.1. The results of these integrations should be reflected in the updates. As the last sentence, the program manager should have a plan for <coughs> HSI, human systems integration in place prior to entering engineering and manufacturing. So again, another plan that has to be is human systems integration. So as you're, build, as you're going through these chapters, you should have a blank sheet of paper and you should be building, okay, this happens before milestone B, this happens before milestone A, and so forth. Because your program manager, remember, they're not working off by themselves developing all these documents. They have integrated product teams that are helping throughout the process. So we're gonna look at integrated product teams later on. 
more in depth, I think, in chapter competency nine. So let's see what it says. The key, and it gives you the summary. Always read your summary. So let me look at my notes. Embedded training is the best. Habitability. Personnel survivability. Program managers to use the elements. Okay. The key to a successful integration strategy is Okay, the key to successful human systems integration strategy is integration. To satisfy the requirements, the program manager should have the plan before milestone B. Okay, so that's, I got everything listed. All right, so this is the end of module four, competency four and competency five. So be sure to subscribe so you can get the updates for the rest of the competencies in this module as I continue to update and refine as I learn more information and become more comfortable with the information since I do not work in acquisition. So I have to continuously study and continuously read up on this information. All right, this is Helen Thomas and the CDFM study group. Thank you again for stopping by and I'll see you guys again next time.